You are listening to PRN.FM, the Progressive Radio Network. Network. Welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin. I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today, first of all, I just want to uh, let everyone know that uh, I am going to be down at Gary Knoll's Ranch in Naples, Florida for the second half of June, June 16th through 30th. Gary will be there and a few other interesting people and it's a rather filled group but there are a couple of spots left i've been told so if you are interested contact gary knoll's office and speak with luann she has the information and will be glad to share it with you so for any of you who would like to be with us for that detoxification retreat there are actually two of them one for one week another for the second and some are staying for both i will be doing a series of uh, stress management workshops lectures and we'll be doing it it'll be experiential we'll be going into wonderful states of contemplation tranquility qigong meditation etc and doing some interesting communication stuff that i do such as therapeutic theater communications workshop etc so if you're interested please come and join us in beautiful naples gary's ranch down there is extraordinary it's like both being in a zoo because there are so many different kinds of animals and it's like being on a way an oasis so uh it would be great if you could come join us if you'd like So, today, talking about such lovely things as that, we're going to be jumping into, taking a quantum leap, if you will, into a very hearty subject. Funny, because we're going to be speaking a lot about the mind, but we're really coming from the heart. And that will all make sense to you in a short amount of time. We have with us today the author of this book, Do You Quantum Think?, New Thinking That Will Rock Your World, Diane Collins. Also, it happens from Miami, from Florida. And <clears throat> Diane has been a consultant, an executive consultant to the Fortune 50 companies for the past many years. She has been a consultant to government officials, to various celebrities and others, helping them see the larger picture. She's developed a unique way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that actually many great people over the course of decades and centuries have been thinking out of the box. And for those of you who listen to A Better World and Progressive Radio Network, you know that we forgot what it's like to even be in the box. And so I really invite you to stay tuned today because we'll uh, be covering these subjects having to do with a larger, more expanded way of thinking, which since thinking is the genesis of all action and all creation, Getting a handle on our thinking can really move us into the orbit, if you will, a new electron orbit that will help us uh, create the better world that we're always talking about here at PRN and on a better world, hence the name. So, Diane, hi. Hello, Mitchell. Have you? It's a delight to be with you. You know, I'm so glad. I've got to say, I was impressed with you early on because. When people come to be on the show, 
I send them the website or my assistant or radio producer does, and they look it over rather scantily usually. You? You studied it. <laughs> you know, you it. took it on like a doctoral <laughs> thesis. You know, you've watched many That's of my true. TV shows and the clips, I should say, on YouTube. You've gone, you've really studied. I'm very impressed with your <laughs> thoroughness. So do you want to sit it's here and I'll sit there? It's been a great delight. <laughs> Maybe that'll happen uh, <laughs> in another realm. <laughs> right, exactly. A parallel universe, right. right? But of course, that's one of the beauties of learning how to quantum think and an expanded model of the universe that we are each other. There is a level on which that is really true. You can think about it physics points it out, you know, and we can also feel I opened up by referencing the heart. We have this <clears throat> awesome organic ability to feel each other's feelings when we're quiet enough and still enough to enter the space of another person. Exactly. And that's really an important point. And, you know, the way that I talk about it, the five faculties of mind, and when I use the word mind, I'm talking about that which includes the heart as well. Because when you think of mind as our individualized form of consciousness. So the consciousness being the unbounded, infinite intelligence, infinitely expansive, right? We can't even really, you cannot wrap words around it. That's no. like the finger pointing to the moon. That's right. We could never say it exactly in words. But what we can say, and I know that you think about this a lot, about our relation, how we relate to the world through language is that when you think of mind as what we hold in awareness and even what we can imagine, even imagining what's unimaginable because we can hold that thought or that concept in our awareness, then it becomes all-inclusive because when you think about the heart and, you know, in Do You Quantum Think, I, I made this line, a, a subheading, <laughs> Thinking gets a bad rap because we all want to be connected to This the is heart. what's dangerous about the two of us. <laughs> Thinking gets a bad rap. Yeah. That the heart, well, first of all, we know as a physical organ that Joseph Chilton Pierce, for example, mm -hmm. called it the fifth aspect of the brain because it contains, I'm sure you know, neuronal, neuronal cells. Sure. It's like got 40,000 neuroreceptor right. sites. And of course, we know from the work of heart math that it has a more powerful electromagnetic field, field than the brain. But when you start to quantum think and you actually think from a whole system, holistic and holographically, mm -hmm. and what you were talking about, we feel <clears throat> each other through the field, then you realize all of it that the heart is not separate from your awareness. You can, the yearnings of the soul, the experiences of that heart connection, what I call the, the, uh, in the spiritual dimension, we can distinguish the, all the different dimensions that we participate in that give rise, you could say, to the physical dimension. And when you start to think of that simultaneously happening, then it becomes very natural that you realize we are all the one being that you spoke of. Yes. It's not just a concept. It's not just no. a cognitive construct. No. There it's... are, in the quantum world, there are distinctions, yet no real separations. In ancient Greek, we get the word sympathy from S-Y-M means simultaneous same simultaneous and pathy well we get pathos of course but it suggests and denotes this notion of sort of one being sharing a same experience yeah that's what it comes to and the chinese and other ancient indigenous traditions speak about the heart mind and actually for the chinese what we refer to as the mind and point to the head doesn't even exist not traditionally, <laughs> right. I should say. Not traditionally. Mm -hmm. They speak about the heart mind, and inside the heart mind is Shen, and Shen is spirit. So the heart is the place where spirit resides. So it shows that, as does a lot of language and uh, 
notions. Well, when we think with our hearts, we know the truth. You know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just check in with your heart and you will know. That's a predominant you, notion it is. in our society. It is. It's, however, we have to remember that the mind is what enables us to even relate to the heart. The mind being, in the way I'm talking about it, is awareness. <clears throat> As and a I mental think that's function? Where, is that what you mean? You know, in terms of what quantum thinking is all about. Right, and a mental, think intellectual actu- function. Well, it's actually a system of thinking that takes us from the either-or, that has us actually living this wisdom, integrating it, being the walking, talking embodiment of it. So when we go from the you can, you can hear in our own speaking this mechanism of the either-or. That comes up for us all day long. Sure. And an aspect of it, even for those of us who are, quote, on the path, seekers, wanting a better world, literally, and not just wanting it, but Working toward co-creating it. it to bring it about, that we can begin to catch ourselves in this more limited way of thinking, mm-hmm. the either or, you know, either the heart or the mind. Dualistic. It's all of it. Truly right. dualistic. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really true. It's really true. We have a duopoly running our government, the Republicans and the Democrats, and you're lucky if you can tell the difference between them. And we have a dual mind, which creates the duopoly, you know. Exactly. In other words, we're always creating and we're reifying reiterating what we consider to be obvious and real. And one of the underlying points of quantum physics, and you really rest a lot on it, which I think is brilliant, that if we want to create a different world, a better world, a new novel world that has is replete with possibility and probability also, um, we can do that by stepping out of the ordinary mainframe of yes or no, or either or, as you put it, and look afresh and see that we are truly one, which is a reality proven by physics. We don't have to go reaching into the ancient Vedic tradition to find it. We can, but it's already here. But you and I know that that science is usually many steps ahead of society. That's exactly right. And in fact, that kind of led me to create quantum thinking in the first yes, place. Yes, you're leading us along. Because I read in this little book, uh, Mr. I think it was Dr. Einstein, or it's, uh, this tiny little book and by Lincoln Barnett about Einstein. And Einstein wrote the foreword. And in it, he talked about how the discoveries of science, now I'm mixing it up in my own head, whether it was Lincoln Barnett or Einstein himself who said it, but the fact that of the book was the discoveries of science take, could take, this was a book written a long time ago, so they said it could take 50 to 100 years mm-hmm. for the discoveries to reach the public mind and awareness. And, and be the reason, integrated. Yeah, that he was writing this is saying, of all the great scientists that Einstein was considered by everyone, they did a survey, one of the greats and in our modern age. And yet very few people actually know what Einstein said or did. So thus he wrote the book. But what I got adapted from this is that, yes, now we have the Internet. So I think everything, they just like his haircut. <laughs> maybe is speeded up, right? Well, he is iconic, right? That haircut. But everything is accelerating, accelerating, and because of our wonderful technologies. And so it would still take the public mind and awareness time to start to integrate, even though they're starting, you know, quantum's becoming the new buzzword, starting to come into our language, and people are asking, well, what is quantum anyway? And some of the principles that were becoming knowledgeable, many, many hundreds of people are writing about it. Practitioners are using it. They're creating, you know, in film. I, what the bleep do we know? Right. What the bleep do we know? Uh, you know, further even down the, the rabbit wait hole. Wait a minute. What about the the uh, James Bond movie? The last one was called A Quantum of Solace, and and so yeah. it's here. Yet, what I discovered is that we actually 
it's time to take a leap to the whole system. Mm -hmm. And so what I realized is instead of waiting for this to eventually filter in, that if I could put it all together for people, right? What are the principles? What are the actual natural faculties of mind that we don't learn in school because the old world industrial age view centered around the physical aspect is real. Only physical matter is I'll real. I'll believe it if I see it. Yeah, that's exactly right. That we only learned about the brain. We don't learn about the faculties of meditation. We don't learn about the faculty of the observer effect and intent as being ESP, the primary dynamic. Right. right. Non-locality. Exactly. Non-local mind and intuition. So when you begin to learn, wait a minute, these are the natural faculties of mind. This is what enables us to literally create consciously with awareness that we're doing so. Well, wouldn't it be a good idea, Mitchell, if we started to master the faculties that we have been divinely endowed with? Totally, Diane. Totally. Right. So, That's why I learned Sanskrit. <laughs> no, Sanskrit, a very important language. Totally. Very important. It so, actually has embedded in it some of the ideas that we are bandying about here, but from an ancient perspective. I mean, I think they were taking the plant medicine known as Soma at the time, at the time that Gordon Wasson talks about. I don't know if oh, you're really? familiar no, with that. Oh, really? No, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, that's I a have whole heard other of Soma. Right. rabbit another, hole we'll talk about another, another time. That's another rabbit hole. But <laughs> you're, it's an interesting one. How would you lay out for our audience what they could do to, one, first, understand quantum think, as you've termed it, and then move into actually living it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing, and that's really the intent of it. You may want to lay out the Newtonian distinction okay. well, so we get it. Right. Well, this is how... The first thing is to, you know, what is the method? Because the first thing is to be able to distinguish that we actually, like all things in the universe think in a system. It's not just, you know, when people in the Bible or the Upanishads or the Buddha said all that we are is the result of what we've thought. As you think, so you become. But what I discovered is that there's a myth of choice. We have every moment mm. the opportunity yes. to choose our thought. But for the most part, we're not. Why not? You know, my question was, if thought creates reality, what creates our thinking? And this was my discovery, is that our thinking is actually shaped. Even what we're able to think, like mm -hmm. the, the uh, concepts that we're it's able to think within. It's within a linguistic box, essentially. It's within a linguistic box that comes to us by virtue of a worldview in the most overarching sense. And so if we mm -hmm. just take the two worldviews in our view right now, mm -hmm. which would be the industrial age, also known as the mechanistic or classical worldview of world rational science. The world is a, a giant clockwork machinery, divide it up into its parts, figure out what they're made of, and you'll be able to predict and control which the Which is whole essentially thing. analytic. It's a left brain function. Right. It's by and cause large. and effect. Right. It's <clears throat> left brain. Linear. It's conceptual. And it's good. It gave rise. Oh it is tremendous genius in that worldview. The motorcycle comes from that. <laughs> and that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Even better than Vespa. <laughs> <laughs> so many, so many amazing things. Truly. However, when you realize that the worldview, those discoveries, actually influence the way that we think then in a sense, if we're operating in a limited worldview, which that is, how do we know? Because science has taken the leap by virtue of Einstein and those who followed him to the, what lovingly called, the new worldview, the quantum worldview for short. Why did Time magazine name Albert Einstein person of the century over such notables as Gandhi or Mother Teresa? Because he literally changed the way that we relate and view the nature of reality. 
literally changed how we see, how we think about the nature of reality. So since then, and this is called, you know, why this quantum leap? We know that quantum science, and I'm not a scientist, so I'm speaking as an ordinary layperson who studies such matters. <laughs> and an, which amateur, I, an amateur, which means lover of what it is you study. Oh, that's good. I yeah. love that. Right. That makes sense. Amateur. Right. So that we know that quantum physics did not come as a linear extension of Newtonian physics. So if you map this on to thinking, I've never actually said it this way before. You're bringing no. this out in yeah. me, Mitchell. Quantum is thinking. That our own, if we want to quantum think, which is to think in the more up-to-date, accurate, and expanded principles at the edge of knowledge today, at the edge of scientific knowledge now, as you point out, verifying what is universal to all ancient uh, spiritual right teachings and traditions that we literally have to take a quantum leap in our own consciousness we do not arrive there linearly so what does it mean it means that instead of being where you are right because you said how do we do this the first thing is to start to practice what I call a new worldview of learning, the art of distinguishing. Mm -hmm. So we're not accumulating, collecting more knowledge of, as information, which we don't need because everything is available at the touch of a smartphone. We don't have to accumulate and memorize. It's all accessible as we know. So instead of that, what do we do? How do we learn? Well, we know when we experience something, right? This goes back to that heart conversation, that that integrates. So what we do when we practice the art of distinguishing, a new world view of learning, is to take something, bring something into your awareness. And in, um, I was trying to think of, there. there's a word in Sanskrit, uh, well, there's different words, but a dharana. For dharana? Yeah, where you contemplate something. But it's even more than that. You bring something into your awareness using the nuances of language, which cr literally creates an experience for you of something that alters your relationship to it forever, past present, and future. So most people, for example, I'm taking the overarching distinction that we just made as an example, we don't really learn that we think in one system or another, that our thinking is predominantly and our cultural systems and structures, as you brought out, the, how did you call it? The dual... dual Duopoly, duopoly of the right. political system. I know that system. comes from... <laughs> That I read actually, that on the on your web on I read that on your website uh, as there we I go. was studying. I, I actually got that from John Hagelin, Doctor John Hagelin, oh, yeah, award-winning physicist right. from Harvard. <laughs> right, I love John Hagelin yeah, and yeah. his thinking is wonderful. A human being, yes. anyway, so important on on the planet today. So, uh, when you are start to when you make this leap, okay. So, what is the old worldview? It taught us to be analytical, linear. To put to if we wanted to have something change in our life, we'd have to push or pull on the circumstances to get it to happen. Things are fixed and solid. You know, you couldn't predict and control unless you could say it's either this way or that way. Where did the either or mechanism come from? Is it a particle or a wave? Well, then the quantum scientists, of course, realize it's both, and you can't see the whole picture unless you're you know this. So. When you start to distinguish that system, well, how does the quantum worldview affect our thinking? Well, we start to live fully dimensionally. I call it FD, living fully <laughs> dimensionally, right? <laughs> in the physical, in the right, instead of 3D, oh, 5D, yeah, FD, so good, right? That we could just infinite possibility universe. You could distinguish any number of dimensions, exactly. but you know, the physical, the subtle energy, the spiritual, the cosmic principles that are operating, the esoteric of prophecy and, and evolution, the divine, you put them all, and everything that we live in, as you know, operates in all those dimensions simultaneously. simultaneously. 
We are speaking with Diane Collins, the author of Do You Quantum Think? New Thinking That Will Rock Your World. You are listening to Mitchell J. Rabin on A Better World on Progressive Radio Network. We are on every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, so please join us. Also, we are on television every Tuesday night at 10.30, and we have a series of really interesting shows there, too, and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. So please join us, and uh, let's return to the talk with Diane Collins. This is fascinating. I want to back up a little bit to okay. say that as I'm listening to you, uh, I, I personally will say that I feel language is the pivot of the game when it comes to thinking. Now there's imagery, the way the mind works. It works often in imagery and it works in language. So you've got light and sound, if you will, uh, which of course is the ancient notion. Which is everything. <laughs> everything, it is everything. Everything comes from that, and, right. You know, you inspired me too because I never quite put it that way. Um, <laughs> but it is true. And um, <clears throat> when you boil it down, uh, what I hear a lot is some notions of Martin Heidegger, who wrote the book Was heißt Denken, which means what is this thing called thinking? I'm reminded of a former Buddhist monk that I am studying with currently, who I had on the show recently, uh, named Yasuhiko Genku Kimura, who teaches workshops in something he refers to as authentic thinking, which is a cousin of all that we're speaking about here. And underneath the undergirding of a lot of this is what I learned from Werner Erhardt. And not just him, but there are all the greats like Gurdjieff who, and Zen who are behind that, all of which are different inquiries into the nature of reality. Honestly, on a similar level, there is the perception psychologist Jerome Bruno, who in Robert Ornstein's book, The Psychology of Consciousness, understand the interesting mechanisms of how outer reality, physical material reality is influencing our minds and physical brain, even our retina, with studies that he did. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but he had um, baby kittens in a room uh, that had only horizontal stripes. Mm, and I he am had familiar them, with Are that. you? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. another group of kittens in another room with only vertical stripes. And it ended up that when they went back into their respective homes, they were able to only see the stripes in which they were originally raised. And they bumped into anything and everything that wasn't that stripe. Right. Which reminds me of that wonderful scene in What the Bleep when... Uh, they're looking out on the horizon and recreating the uh, scene of when the native peoples of America, of Turtle Island, were watching for Columbus and the ships to come. And they couldn't see it because they had no anchor in reality or language, I'll say, or imagery to discern, distinguish, which is why what you're saying about distinctions is so important, the ship. Exactly. And it wasn't only until the idea was introduced that there could be something called a ship out there that's getting closer were they able to actually physically see it. Right. So we They literally know couldn't see it. They literally couldn't see they it. They could language it. That's that goes back right. to the Helen Keller, of right? Of course it does. Uh, she didn't she got the world when she got her first word. Yes. Water. Right. Exactly. There was no world. You know, when you were talking earlier, Mitchell, about... Um, but that's that whole cybernetic domain of and, uh, Gregory Bateson, all of them understanding, you know, Margaret Mead's former husband, you know... Who, I know who Gregory These were the Bateson. precursors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of Fritz Perls, who you were speaking about yeah. earlier, mm -hmm. and even uh, Milton Erickson, and certainly our favorite uh, Richard Bandler and Grinder, you know, right. the f <laughs> formulators of neurolinguistic programming. Yes. Now... What so if? So you get all that. And the Sufi adage of, I'll see it when I believe it. Yeah. So right. take that and the anchor so, in language. Now, Please go on. let's go to, I think, the idea, two really crucial ideas. One is the heart of the matter of what you're saying when you reference all of these people and how the experimentation has been. How much agility, ability that we actually have 
to create reality, mm. literally. So we know we're influenced by what appears to be external. Again, there is no separation. This is in science called the observer effect. This yes. was a very important uh, experiment that was the highs that became known as Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty. And you know, when the you said, I'll, "I'll hop right to had about the living it," yeah. But what I want, let's hold that uncertainty principle for a minute because I want to get into that. But the idea that one, we have unlimited creativity and the, we actually have the power and the wherewithal to create much more than we're consciously using. And I think Gurdjieff, for example, and some of the people from that time period where they said, you know, we were mechanical man. And it was mm -hmm. really in that time of the mechanistic worldview. Right. And so that was reflected in their observations, in their philosophies, in their what they came up with as human technologies. So when we look now where we don't have time, really, in terms of what people are saying, you know, being at this critical juncture for humanity, that we and the earth, let's not forget the host of our bodies. Gaia. Right. Where because we're influenced as a collective by the old world view, that why do we have the divisiveness around uh, bringing green technologies or take, just taking care of the earth? You know, why do people want to get rid of environmental yeah. protection? Why isn't that the number one? Why or do they ridicule... Vibrational energy medicine. And you see, this is it, right. Because we are so conditioned by the old world, classical world, physical only is real Material. view that we're not actually in the experience, I mean, some of us are, that the Earth is a living organism, Gaia, that is the host of our life, just as we host 40,000 organisms, exactly. microorganisms on our body that can't not, cannot live without our body. We can't live without the earth. So when this kind of thinking becomes pr prominent, which of course is my intent, <laughs> is my mission, is my campaign, and I want to include yes. my husband, Alan Collins, who's my partner in all yes. things in this, that this is what has to happen now. And I'm saying has to. I know a lot of people say, forget the shoulds and the ought tos. Well, I drop, you know, I say, forget <laughs> about forgetting about the shoulds and the ought tos. Why don't we say we really want? <laughs> <laughs> no, we are. See, that's the leap, is that when we make the leap and start realizing, oh, we exist in fields. We're always exchanging, as you said. We're ex we are influencing the field with our intent. We're able to access information across the planet because of our intuitive faculty. I consider meditation one of our natural faculties of mind, not just a practice, although the practice of it is important. And, you know, I do it and everyone should to to increase that, quote, muscle as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But the meditational uh, function. function, that's natural to us. So as you said, when we're able to, as I like to think of quantum thinking as a walking, talking, living meditation, mm -hmm. what if we could literally be established in that state all the time, established in the all that is simultaneous with the individualized persona, personality, the role we play, the play of consciousness that we all play in this incarnation on Earth. The distinction known as Diane Collins and that one known as <laughs> Alan Collins and that, and one, that known one known as, as Mitchell, Mitchell Raven, Raven and, and everyone else who's, <laughs> who's here with us in this virtual room. Yes. And so when you, when you realize that the system, when you make the leap, no matter how much you know, if you make the leap and start looking from the principles rather than at them through your current undistinguished view, 
because right now it's like a mishmash. It's mixed up. It's overlapping. It's like sometimes, you know, you're tuning into a <clears throat> subtle energy field and you're saying, well, wait a minute, that fruit isn't for me. And sometimes you're not even aware that that's one of the natural faculties of mind that we can start to live in today's world where we have three conditions. Accelerating pace of change, which is a scientific fact, which the scientists say, and particularly I'm referring to Peter Russell, that there's no indication it's going to slow down. So the accelerating, and this is where it gets, you know, very, you know, every day, let's look at what's our experience of reality. Speeding up, no indication it's going to slow down. Secondly, we have increasingly increasing complexity and in choices because of our amazing technology, which we all love. And thirdly, the uncertainty that is a great surprise daily because we're in this in the in an overarching in the cosmic sense of evolution. An overall quantum soup. Right. We're 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 in this evolutionary time when the systems are going to be breaking down and crumbling and coming under scrutiny and we need to be in this more expanded view so when you look at how does that affect us in our daily experience yes. well if you're thinking that you have to have all the circumstances lined up in front of you before you'll make a decision if you're thinking that you have to take a step-by-step -step how to approach which is still I'm not in I'm, it's a extremely valid and in many areas of life. But in terms of what we're talking about, when we want to create literally a new reality, a better earth, a better world, that we need to be able to think in quantum leaps and to know how these faculties of mind work because the opposite of it, and maybe I don't want to take you out of a job, is stress and burnout. <laughs> I know you do stress management. But when you think about it, if everything's speeding up, and don't you, I'm sure you do, Mitchell, we actually experience, even though we're still working in clock time, in you know this superimposed chronological time, but I it's am getting still, younger and slowing we're down. Getting sl that's good. <laughs> but do you have an experience, though, of things moving quicker? It's oh, like all of a sudden, sure. 2012 starts, and it's like, wow, it's June. Oh, you know, that's yeah. when we're doing this, oh, this particular yeah. show, of course. Oh, yeah. So when you think about these things, quantum thinking, the intent of it is to say, what if you could think in sync? beyond time, it, in sync with this speeded up world, in sync with the nature of uncertainty. I'm glad I said that because I wanted to go back to the uncertainty to get to some real, real principle. What if we could think in sync with that rather than being stuck still trying to figure it out, the analytical either or, oh, should I do this job or that job? Well, how about both? How can I integrate all the different interests in my life from one whole view? Well, let me, let me interrupt you here, because what you're saying, of course, maps out linearly, interestingly, very well. <laughs> and uh, within it are these beautiful, like, gold mines and land mines at the same time of brilliance, <laughs> which are good. all invitations <laughs> to think globally, think holistically, whole brain thinking, and to step out of even the brain, even out of the mind as we know it. And that is a really interesting function. And I have, in my work uh, with clients, have for so many years invited them to practice a certain playful exercise, which is called shoot you to the moon, which is this idea of let's stop looking at ourselves on this horizontal level and let's go vertical. In fact, imagine that you are at on the moon looking down. Oh my, that's <laughs> one big beautiful thing, you know? And in short, you slowly change the aperture to come in and make finer distinctions about what it is you you see and as you get closer and closer and closer in you have still the objective awareness of being outside 
the globe, not the box in this case. And you bring that freshness, which is, let me get really graphic about it, new neuronal connections, new yes. dendrites growing, new interconnectedness in the physical brain itself. And I love mapping psychology to neuroscience because there's a direct relationship to the conversation we're having with the reality of changing the brain, which, of course, is why our dear friend Richard Bandler called his book Changing the Brain, Using the Brain, using, I'm sorry, right. for a change. For a change, and right. Because right. the brain literally changes with new thinking. Right. And with opening it up. I with know his opening it up. was about opening Very it up. Very much so. So New the reason sensations. I grabbed your I grabbed your hand, I know people why. on the radio, because I wrote <laughs> that in my book exact as an yeah. example of and I use oh. that a lot with people, of a quantum leap. Because when you do that, and this is what I was getting to in today's world, we when we grasp that Reality can work, and it does, in quantum leaps. Our mind is quantum leaping all the time. So what you did is you did a guided quantum leap. When yes. you say the shoot to the moon, right? Right. It's a consciously aware guided quantum leap. To Because normally we experience that we're in our bodies and looking out at the world looking standing on the earth and looking out and as you say you you flipped it around and now we can do that so when someone says well what do you mean take a quantum leap in consciousness that's exactly what mm. i mean just what you distinguish so let's said. take this diane to a place that is often perceived as troubled and that is the body politic Good. How would you take this brilliant, expanded perception and perspective into that domain in the world we see today with it happens that there is Obama in the White House and then there are all these other people and people are vying and doing what they're doing? Right. OK. What would you say? I love if this conversation. Obama was your client. <laughs> I would say, can I give the principal uh, oh, yes. That, re Caprice, that oh, we yes. need to be aware of oh, yes. as I'm saying this. Okay. Getting back to the Heisenberg, we'll bring Obama into it. I happened to meet Obama once. I said, did you ever hear of quantum thinking? It was before my book came out. And he said, oh, quantum thinking? No, but I've heard of quantum physics. Okay, there's hope there, <laughs> as he would use that word. Now, what Has he ever heard of the Constitution? <laughs> anyway, okay, that's what we have to get to because uh, it's like this. There was the experiment done, right, by Heisenberg, what, where a discovery was made that he couldn't measure. Now, a lot of people are familiar with this, but I want to say it in the context. Mm -hmm. A particle of energy, the velocity or the speed, and the location at the same time. Which is logical, isn't it? Because if we're in a universe where everything is energy and flux and formed by intelligence, then if you have the if you're taking the speed, it's not stand nothing is standing still. So it's you can't moving get too fast. Right. So from this came uncertainty. Furthermore, then he discovered that the instrument of observation was also having an effect because, as you stated earlier. Yeah. Where everything is affected by everything else. This interconnected The butterfly thing, effect right, we also have. It's no joke, right? Yes. It's no joke. So, <laughs> it's no joke. <laughs> it's God not wasn't new. kidding. Hey, wait a minute. It's not new age, la, la, wah, wah, woo, woo, whatever no, no. people refer to it as. It's yeah. like, you know, let's get hip and let's learn the yeah. science here and let's really get yeah. the fact of, our ex of what's going on. So, again... Quantum think is not about science. It's about how the discoveries of science can shape the way we think, how we can proactively shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So the observer effect, right? The instrument of observation for us is what we hold in awareness, a.k.a. the human mind. What we hold in our awareness is always shaping our experience. So you could say, we have a thought, we give it meaning. That meaning may give us an emotional experience, maybe not, maybe it's emotion neutral, but whatever it is, that meaning, as you say, having to do with language, gives us our experience, right? Mm -hmm. So we would say it, 
in quantum thinking, the pr- main core principle of the 21 plus one is observer created reality. We're living in an observer created reality. What you bring is what you get. So if you come to a situation, body, po- body politic, and you come to a situation where you have made judgments and conclusions because that are not, quote, the absolute truth. Why? Because it's an observer-created reality. The observer effect is always in effect. The, uh, the wisdom masters say it, the world exists on the screen of your own consciousness. There's no separation between the observed and the observer. All of reality exists in how we hold it. Okay? It's happening right here. Exactly. Yeah, it's That's happening the right phrase here. I use all the time. It's happening it right here. as we hold it to be. Right. So now, if we know that, yes. something is always shaping our reality. It's either the de- default set of circumstances that are just in place. Who knows? Who cares? I don't go into the analysis of it, and I don't really think it's important, actually, to say, you'll never get to it anyway, right? Well, my mother said that, and that must be why I'm like that. That's cause and effect. That's all worldview thinking, which is okay. But the important thing is, does it get you anywhere? Let me give a distinction here. Okay. It's not just a question of okay. It's a question of a level of reality as a subset of the larger quantum field. So linear linearity has its reality. Yes, it does. Newtonian physics has given us the Vespa and everything else, your way of getting here from Miami. You did not walk, nor did you put yourself in front of a flashlight and and travel here that way either as an atom. So Newtonian physics has given us a world that we currently have. So all I'm saying is it's a subset. It's a subset. It's Definitely. Neutral. It's part of the totality of exactly. reality. It's and one you're whole system. Bringing us but, forward yeah, because to a larger way of being and thinking. Well, and why? You know, because we want a better world. Yeah. We want a politic that works. Right. So when you th- when on a you, higher level of truth, truth if you stay there, okay, because yeah. here it is. I say it very simply in quantum thinking. What you bring is what you get. Mm-hmm. If you bring, okay, if you know that there are the bottom line of the quantum mm-hmm. reality, it's an uncertainty. There is it's a it's a world of possibility waiting to happen, right? A cloud of possibility waiting to happen by the intent of the observer. Right? Right. Got that. Now, how does it show up? Okay. Okay. Now, if we we know that there is no absolute, yet, because of our old world conditioning, we come into situations as if there are absolutes, as if this guy is right, this guy is wrong, as if... All the old baggage. All the old baggage, which is not helpful because when you understand the physics of mind, how we create reality based on what we hold in our awareness, right? No, not to be true. Just on what we hold. Yes. Because context but, is everything. I know, but and we hold it is, to be, we act on what we hold, what we believe is true. Okay. Having nothing to do with whether it's true or not, it's. Right, exactly. But what a I'm saying is you. position. That's it. We leap from the lockdown position. You recognize it. And you say, you know yeah. what? What's going on for us in politics? We're in an us and them situation. Now, war. It, for example, is an us and them situation. It has never worked because think about it. If you are what you consider yourself, if someone considers themselves the 99%, then they want, they're going to go against the 1% attack. Attack, attack doesn't work. That is not quantum thinking. There may be goodness and, and uh, validity in, I like the idea of people having a voice, of, of voicing their voice, and all of that, of bringing out, of distinguishing where there may be inequities. Yet, if you want to get to a solution-based society, mm-hmm. which is what I am all about, I know you are, then we have to think in a new way. We have to go to looking from the whole for the whole catching ourselves in that 
as long as we're holding in us and in them, as long as we're attacking, we're not in the reality experience of what you were talking about earlier. That we, we say the words, it becomes lip service or conceptual. We are one, but we're not in the experience of it until you can make these distinctions in your own thinking in the moment it happens, Mitchell. So as soon as you catch yourself, I call it, I borrow the term from science, a least action pathway. Actually, I learned it from Dr. Fred Allen Wolf. The way the energy goes, as you, we were talking mm-hmm. about this earlier, mm-hmm. right? The path of least resistance. The way the energy goes, because it's been that route before. It's an automatic way of thinking, pattern of thinking, approach to a situation, so how you hold someone. We have two minutes left, and I still want to know what you would say to Obama. What I would say to yes. Obama is this. I would say, first of all, two minutes. I do want to work with Obama, and so if you're listening, <laughs> okay. I would say to him, let's get first of all, connected to what he is really in politics for, right? So the first thing is it seems Back like he's gotten, right, he's gotten off of his life purpose and why he's here. And that when he begins to see that how he's holding, whatever he's holding, which is that he's caught in the vortex of the political campaign funding mechanism, which says, you know, let's do the advertising, the analysis, you know, you have to say this to get that faction of society. But what would happen if he actually started thinking for the whole, from the whole? What if he started thinking, instead of going around, and this is the problem the Democrat Republicans, Republicans, everyone knows, right, the automatic least action pathway of that co- They're for the rich, the Democrats are for the poor in the middle. Well, what if there was one politician who actually said, we need to take care of the rich, the middle, the poor. I don't even like to think of people that way, but I'm using that terminology. That would be one thing as we would take. Yes. People of every economic status. Let's see how we can actually have things work for everyone, not just this side or that side. That and start to speak. It would be a very that. good start. because people would respond to that. You see, he's in a cause and effect I have to RS. End this sh- okay, the session, right? If so you, you will. got it. it would I be got a it leap from cause and effect. <clears throat> that would be a beautiful moment for our world, <laughs> and so I hope you do reach his ear and speak these words to him. He's in our vicinity, you know, having dinner in New yeah, York somewhere we tonight. Have speaking of fundraising, and, yeah. uh, have a plate of food with him. <laughs> Diane, thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing with us your brilliant quantum thoughts. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Love being with you. It's really a pleasure. It really is. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thanks. I think it's making a difference. And exactly. you, straight back at you. Good, good. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember to visit us at our website at www.abetterworld.tv. Get on the newsletter if you're not on it already. That way you can know what's going to be on every single week with our guests. Or we have call-ins and we speak to our audience and uh, give some counsel. Learn a lot myself. Thanks again for joining us and I'll see you all next week.